slide. Yep, it's in there somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay. Nope. How does one? There's a little tiny screen, uh, full screen button. Go. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Brian, hello everyone. Hi there, everybody. All right, now we get to see if my speaker notes work. It works. All right, so what is OGVJS, this crazy little thing? Uh, there's actually two answers to that, uh, which are separately what it does and what it is. Uh, what it does for now is still fulfill a need that Wikipedia had uh, to play certain uh, free, uh, royalty-free open formats in every browser for every user even if there's no native support for it. Uh, and what it is, is essentially a JavaScript re-implementation of HTML5's video stack, starting with the video element itself. Does that even work? I mean, that sounds crazy, right? Well, let's give it a shot. This is a uh, screen recording from several iOS devices, and we'll see if it actually plays. Come on, YouTube, you can do it. Stop it. Yay, it worked. <laughs> now I have to go to the next slide. There we go. All right, so why would we do this? Sounds insane, why, why? Well, let's all jump back in our Wayback Machine, uh, set it for the year 2001. Uh, this was a wacky time in the internet. You may have heard of uh, open source software and things like that that were still new and exciting at the time. Uh, Wikipedia was just beginning in this climate. Uh, we were very heavily influenced by the free and open source software movements. Uh, we selected open licenses, uh, share-alike style, uh, even before Creative Commons was out and known. And uh, we have used open source software for all of our server-side needs uh, for the last 15 years. Now, one thing that uh, free and open source folks often have in common is a intense distrust of software patents and uh, other intellectual property restrictions. Um, you may remember the days of burn all GIFs. Uh, in the early 1990s, or the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, a company called Unisys had some patents that uh, it discovered it had on the LZW compression format used in GIF images. Uh, and they started shaking down companies and open source projects that were using GIF images uh, or supported them. Uh, this was kind of not cool. A lot of people were really organizing against it uh, back in the day. And uh, in fact, Wikipedia, oops, am I still working? There we go. In fact, Wikipedia, uh, for its first few years, did not allow GIF uploads. Uh, it wasn't until the patents expired in 2004 that we started adding them. Uh, and for the same concerns, uh, we avoided the MP3 format, which was pretty popular in those days, but again, had a number of patents and uh, an active company um, trying to make sure that people paid for those patents. Um, at the time, we chose the OGVORBIS format, which was uh, very popular at the time among open source, and, but also among commercial projects, uh, because it was both royalty-free and pretty high quality, uh, comparing well against MP3. Uh, you may also remember that back in these days, video formats on the web, monstrous. You had so many choices, vendor-specific, you had to pull, download a plugin, Maybe you had to download a codec pack, uh, all kinds of trouble. Uh, it was not cool, not cool at all. So uh, we again went with an AUG-based format, uh, which was AUG Theora, um, which was based on Onto's VP3 codec. Uh, I believe it was VP3, not, yes, VP3. Um, this was a somewhat older codec and didn't compare quite as well against H.264, which was, uh, coming out brand new at the time. Um, 
but it was good enough and uh, it was totally free and open, so we went with it at the time. Um, you may remember in the year 2007, uh, the Opera browser proposed actually adding a video element to HTML for the first time, replacing the old array of multiple different plugins. Uh, they recommended, in fact, using Ogfiora as a baseline format because it was royalty free and it was pretty good and there was uh, free software available to decode it. Uh, they actually cited uh, Wikipedia as an example of a site using Fiora. And we also had some nice technology, well, for the time. Uh, there was a Java applet developed by, uh, I believe it was Fluendo, um, which used a Java port of uh, the Vorbis and Theora decoders and could play back these files even in browsers that didn't support Opera's proposal. Now, you may remember there were some fights on the mailing list in the, uh, the W3C. Vendors did not agree on which format should be the baseline codec. Uh, some vendors were feeling very strongly that a royalty-free baseline codec was absolutely necessary, even if it wasn't the best quality available. Uh, others worried that there was a risk of submarine patents, uh, whereas, for instance, the MPEG-based formats had a known patent pool so, yeah, you had to pay for the patents, but at least you knew who to pay the patents to. So we ended up with uh, this fun little world where there was a standard for dealing with video, but not a single standard for actually implementing video. Uh, this left Wikipedia in kind of a mixed, mixed state for uh, video and audio. We worked great in some browsers. Firefox, Opera, Chrome, they worked with all the OGG stuff and uh, they worked with the better WebM when it came out. But if you were using Internet Explorer or Safari, um, things were not so great. You could use our Java applet, but uh, eventually Java kind of fell out of favor on the web. And uh, we ended up having this very poor experience where people using the default browsers on their machines, on Windows or Mac OS, uh, were simply not able to view our files. This wasn't really great because we had chosen a patent-free format, or rather royalty-free format, uh, specifically in order to make our files more accessible and more reusable, but it was becoming a practical problem uh, that actual end users could not read them. Well, the obvious possibility is just transcode the dang things. You know, it would make sense, and it would not be technically difficult to take all of our AUG and WebM files and convert them out to H.264 and uh, then send one to one and the other to the other and everything would just work. But we still had to deal with getting the patent license. And not only did we have to get the patent license, but we had to agree to the patent license. Now, Wikipedia and uh, Wikimedia Foundation is a very interesting community in that um, we are not actually, as a company, running the project. The projects are run primarily by volunteers, many thousands of them, uh, in a you know, classic open source style, wisdom of the crowds, all that fun stuff. And it's really cool, but every once in a while it's really inconvenient um, when decisions are made that are not what would have been the easiest thing technically. Um, we ended up, oops, I am ahead of slide. So we ended up um, not being able to get the community to agree to what was a secret agreement. Um, the MPEG-LA license agreement is actually under NDA, and even though the terms are pretty well known, it ends up being kind of anathema to a community like ours that's deeply, deeply suspicious of intellectual property issues. So we turned to a research project I was working on, which was to use JavaScript to decode uh, audio and also video directly in the browser. Uh, I was able to start deploying this last year uh, on the desktop and uh, it is completely replaced at this point the Java applet that no one can use. Uh, this is definitely an improvement. So if you're on uh, Firefox, Chrome, or Opera, you get native pl playback. It's pretty awesome. If you're on uh, Edge, Internet Explorer, or Safari, you get the JavaScript playback 
and you probably don't really notice the difference, uh, unless, of course, it goes horribly slow or breaks, which sometimes happens. There's still bugs. So how does it actually work? Uh, the basic building blocks of OGVGS are all standard components of uh, the web platform. So you use XML HTTP requests to pull things from the network, uh, although I ended up having to build an abstraction on top of that to fetch files as if they were a stream. And uh, web workers for threading, WebGL for accelerated GPU operations such as YUV conversion, uh, and of course, web audio for audio output. There's also a very exciting thing called ASMJS, which uh, some people may be familiar with, which I will get to very shortly. Uh, some of the abstractions around this are also now available as separate libraries on NPM. So if you want to do chunked streaming in the browser of a potentially very large file, that you just want to buffer a little bit of and read through bit by bit, there's a package for that. If you want to uh, take your YUV frames and blit them to a WebGL canvas, well, I got a module for that. If you want to output a big stream of audio and not worry about whether it's web audio or flash backing it, I've got that too. Now, the real fun part, of course, is not uh, the output. The really fun part is, how the hell do you actually decode this stuff? Uh, well, what I'm doing here is I'm actually using the C libraries that everybody else uses. So just as Firefox or Chrome builds in libvpx and uh, libvorbis and all those little bits, uh, OGVGS is using the exact same libraries. So instead of having to manually rewrite and then maintain everything just to get it working, uh, I was able to use a tool called Inscriptin. Uh, this is a compiler that actually is based on the Clang compiler that uh, is very well known. Uh, this builds your C or C++, uh, C++ code base into a uh, LLVM bit code. Uh, and then that converts into a subset of JavaScript called ASMJS. ASMJS uh, can be pretty efficiently JIT compiled, uh, and it basically presents a C-like environment to JavaScript code. Uh, this is based around having a giant array where you just say, here's your address space. Go deal with it. Uh, and then all your functions turn into JavaScript functions, and those deal with memory as if it were a Unix process. There are certain limitations uh, but it works quite well. It's actually pretty widely used for OpenGL-based games, bringing them to the web, um, although I'm mostly using it for the library end. Now, all of this is made possible by uh, general advances in the environment. Um, Moore's Law, anyone remember Moore's Law? It's not dead yet, it's still going, especially on the ARM end. Every year, Apple puts out a new iPhone damn things 75% faster than the previous one. Uh, this is really cool because when I started on OGVGS, I was thinking there's no way I'm ever gonna be able to deploy this thing on mobile. That's crazy. But earlier I was showing you those screencasts from an iPad playing 1080p. It works. Um, also things like GPU acceleration with WebGL, uh, that basically cuts out 50% of the CPU cost. Um, which is really nice. Uh, that means you can play one resolution higher than uh, I would have been able to otherwise. But all this stuff is still, of course, bucking a major trend, which is offloading expensive but common operations such as video decoding from the CPU to dedicated silicon. So the obvious disadvantage of using the CPU for this is that we're probably gonna use more energy. I haven't actually measured battery usage but uh, I'm pretty sure that if you watch a two-hour movie on your iPad in JavaScript, it's not gonna be great for your battery. <laughs> so this is a trade-off that we made primarily oriented around having relatively short video clips. Uh, and kind of our hope is that at some point in the future, everyone will agree on a format uh, that we'll all be able to use. There's another disadvantage, uh, which is that using the older OGTheor codec, uh, although it performs very well in terms of CPU usage, 
uh, it doesn't compress as well as the newer codecs. Uh, even VP8 does significantly better uh, and would save us some bandwidth, but it wouldn't actually work as efficiently in the JavaScript environment um, because it's simply a lot slower. So what does it look like uh, in your web page when you've got an OGVJS player? Uh, what you want is something that acts like a video element as much as possible. And uh, what I've basically done is just created a custom element. You do document.createElement OGVJS, uh, and then sort of monkey patch in the entire DOM API for a video element. So you can tell it play, you can ask it, can you play this type? You can seek by setting the current time variable, all these fun little things. Uh, which makes it pretty easy to uh, integrate into environments such as VideoJS, um, which we're going to be deploying in the future for a uh, improved video player experience. So at the moment, there are no actual controls on OGVJS. Uh, it's assumed that you're gonna have custom controls because, well, everyone does. And of course, we are in our deployment, we're gonna be wrapping it with VideoJS. But uh, how do you actually output? The simple answer is to use a canvas. Just like you can draw anything else to uh, a canvas element in a web page, you can draw a video. Uh, and in fact, it's relatively straightforward to do so. Uh, but of course, by relatively straightforward, I'm lying. You, because you cannot draw YUV frames to a canvas. A canvas is RGB. So you do have to do YUV conversion uh, which, of course, if you do a simple implementation, is horribly inefficient. You just do a bunch of JavaScript that goes through pixel by pixel. You say, multiply this, add that, put it over there, and it eats up all your CPU time. What you want is to use WebGL. Uh, you basically take the same thing. You have three texture planes, your Luma and your two Chroma, uh, and you just draw them on a single rectangle. This is the simplest WebGL program ever. Because, uh, you know, rectangles, they're not that hard. Well, it's WebGL, so they are hard. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? So what you do is you combine those in a shader. The shader does the magic. Uh, and it turns out the math is a lot faster on the GPU than on the CPU. I did run into one really exciting problem, though, which is that on Windows, uh, uploading those individual textures was really slow. And it turns out that uh, uploading a single color texture that's one byte, per, uh, one byte value per pixel is really slow. I think there's some kind of mismatch between the Direct3D drivers and the OpenGL drivers. Uh, so what I actually do is I pretend that they're RGB textures, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, a quarter of the width. Uh, and then I have another texture that just has stripes drawn on it in various colors that I use to multiply, combine, and then extract a certain pixel. It's kind of a nasty hack, but it ends up being pretty much exactly as fast as uh, not using this weird hack on other browsers, uh, but in IE and Edge on Windows, it's a lot faster. The situation is a little simpler with audio. And by simpler, of course, I mean not simple at all. Uh, there's a wonderful thing called web audio, uh, which is implemented now in every major browser, which is fantastic. And it lets you output or even input uh, audio in various situations. And you can build a filter graph of nodes and pan things in 3D and have multi-channel. It's really, really complicated. Uh, it turns out that a lot of people, such as me, uh, really only need one thing out of web audio, uh, which is a single node that says, here's some data, output it. And then you output that over time. So that's what I'm using. It's called, uh, I believe, the script processor node, and, uh, or in older versions, JavaScript node. Of course, uh, nothing is simple in web standards. And uh, you basically just pipe it out, and it sends you events that say, oh, I'm running low on audio. Give me more audio. It's pretty easy. Um, of course, is that the right place? It is. Excellent. Right slide. 
Um, there is, however, a slight surprise in that uh, web audio has a fixed sampling rate. So we have to do a resample most of the time from you know, 44.1 to 48, or 48 to 44.1, or 2205 to whatever it is. You know how it goes. So there's a very simple uh, naive resample filter that probably could be improved, uh, but it works. And you basically just wait for that to say, I have more audio, and once you've decoded it, you send it in. Uh, on IE11, of course, uh, there is no web audio. So I had to also create a Flash backend for this. Uh, the Flash backend, oops, there we go. The Flash backend is slightly more complicated uh, because it turns out that if you send an array of floating point numbers to the Flash plugin, uh, what it does internally is it turns those into an XML document where every number is wrapped <laughs> in a node. And then on the other end, the Flash plugin parses the XML document, recreates an array, and then sends that to your Flash code. Um, this does not perform very well when you're sending out 48,000 samples every second. Um, so we work around that. Um, the uh, data is actually transferred as a string. Uh, I just take all these floating point samples, multiply them into integers, and then turn them into a big hex string and then Flash does the opposite. It's kind of crazy, but it ends up using less CPU. So how does all this actually perform uh, in practice? Uh, I have a little thing I call the Safari scale, uh, which is I just look at what are the, the major generations of iOS devices currently available. Uh, if we start with the lowest end thing out there right now, uh, you got the iPhone 4S. Now, this has finally been end of life. It's no longer supported, um, which is good because it doesn't perform very well. You can barely do 160p. Uh, on an iPhone 5, you can manage 240, maybe 360. Uh, on the 64-bit devices, things get so much better. Uh, and I can actually pretty reliably pump out 720p at, uh, uh, with Aug Fiora, or 360, maybe 480, uh, on VP8. And this, it turns out, is about the same as an old Core 2 Duo. Uh, so your old Mac and your uh, new iPhone look kind of the same. Uh, and in fact, the latest generation are pretty much in parity, which I think says a lot about the JIT compiler uh, in Safari. They're doing a bang up great job. Uh, I actually get uh, 1080p similarly on both the iPad and uh, the MacBook. Uh, if you want to do Ultra HD, though, don't try. It doesn't work. Uh, I can almost get 1440p. I cannot get 2160. Um, that is not a good thing. And the main reason that it's not good uh, is because you are single-threaded. Now, we already went over battery. Battery is not good. Uh, another performance problem is the loading time. Uh, there is a possibility that should improve that. Uh, the, web, the browser makers are working on something called WebAssembly, which basically takes the techniques of the Imscripten compiler and uh, creates a binary format and then a slightly different compiler around that. Uh, this means it will be a lot more efficient to actually load the modules that do the decoding. Um, you're also very sensitive to disruption on the main thread uh, because not only is the main thread doing your uh, video playback, uh, it's also doing some very expensive operations potentially with DOM manipulation or whatever the hell else your web page is doing at the same time. And uh, if there's a garbage collection pause that pauses the main thread for more than you know, 40, 30 milliseconds, you are going to have a late frame. I sure hope that's not me. Okay. Uh, and in general, the video decode time ends up really dominating CPU usage at non-trivial resolutions. Uh, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone here. Um, videos have simply gotten bigger and bigger and higher resolution, and it's a lot more pixels and a lot more bits to deal with. And uh, currently within the web platform, you cannot do shared memory multi-threading, which is my next slide. 
there is, again, a way to uh, improve this being worked on by the browsers, uh, which is called shared array buffer. Uh, this is a way for JavaScript threads, which are entirely separate worlds, they cannot share objects, to share a binary buffer. Uh, which it turns out is pretty well compatible with how pthreads work in C programs. Unfortunately, it's not widely implemented yet and uh, is not yet available for use. Another problem, of course, is there's no SIMD instructions. Uh, single instruction, multiple data, uh, parallelized instructions. Uh, you, you very frequently in video encoding want to be able to say, do this thing four times or eight times right next to each other. Um, and for instance, VP8 and VP9 really rely on the, that ability uh, in their uh, deblocking filter and uh, the six tap filter for motion prediction. So I'm kind of hoping that this is gonna come in. There is again a proposal being worked on and some implementations, uh, which I believe nightly versions of Firefox, Chrome, and uh, if you turn on experimental options, Edge uh, also support. But it's not in Safari yet, can't rely on it. Kind of hoping it'll come at some point. So some future, future directions that I want to go with this project. Uh, the first is making it possible to do Demuxer and codec plugins much more easily. Right now it's kind of hard coded, it only knows a few codecs. Uh, and if you want to add another format, you have to directly modify the main repository. It should be fairly simple to add new formats, uh, which I think would be useful both for supporting legacy formats in web-based applications and uh, supporting new experimental formats. Uh, so for instance, I'm hoping to work on a AV1 <coughs> codec plugin for uh, the Alliance for Open Media's uh, new uh, codec. Uh, it will probably not perform very well for Ultra HD, but uh, it should work well enough to run demo examples in the browser. Uh, so you can do things like see how the codec actually looks on some real data that is not just a still image, but actually motion. Another thing I really, really want to do is actually output to a video instead of to Canvas. The problem is right now there's no good way to get uncompressed video data uh, that you've synthesized or decoded through some other means into a video. There's actually a way to do it in some browsers. Uh, using the Media Streams Capture API uh, if it's supported on a canvas. So what you can do is draw to a canvas, uh, which of course involves a YUV to RGB conversion, and then capture the canvas, which gives you a media stream, which you then set into the video, and it turns out this actually works, which is kind of crazy. But um, the one problem is of course, it's not widely supported. Uh, Internet Explorer and uh, Edge don't support this yet, although Edge has pretty good media stream support overall with its object RTC implementation. Uh, and Safari currently has no support whatsoever for media streams. I'd also like to support media source extensions, which anyone who's worked with media source extensions is probably now laughing at me. That's okay. I will enjoy the pain um, because we're gonna to need to do adaptive streaming uh, to better support users with low bandwidth or high bandwidth or bandwidth that fluctuates. And uh, it would be nice to do it regardless of browser. Uh, so in theory, I should be able to put something together that emulates the media source extensions interface uh, after refactoring some of the internals. Uh, and then we can uh, take definitely WebM, maybe even AUG, and do the streaming. Uh, I'm hoping that I can improve the performance on VP8 enough that we're willing to actually use it in production for uh, OGBJS, though. And where I think things get really interesting would be server-side usages. Uh, and this may be crazy, or it may be something that some people really want, uh, but it's something I want, uh, which is being able to use these browser-based APIs for media manipulation, both on the client-side code and in server-side code. And if you're doing that, you have the advantage that you can plug in native modules. So instead of having these cross-compiled JavaScript decoders, we can go ahead and have the decoder be a native node module that's actually using the native library. Uh, this could be useful for, for instance, transcoding, WebRTC, bots, 
uh, testing where you want to um, have automated headless testing of something that deals with the video element, all kinds of potential. I would also like to support encoding. Uh, again, I think this is mostly useful for server-side uh, cases where you're doing transcoding. Uh, but we also have some little edge cases where uh, we want to be uh, uh, make it easy for people to contribute audio and video assets uh, that they create themselves. Um, if your browser doesn't natively support uh, encoding to WebM, but it does support recording audio and video, well, why not do that and then encode your short clip <laughs> in JavaScript while you're uploading. Maybe crazy, maybe fun. Uh, so that's a little crazy, but I think it's a pretty cool project, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll be useful to a few of you out there. So, any questions? AV Sync, excellent question. Yes, we have AV Sync. <laughs> um, and the way that it works is to rely on the audio clock from uh, web audio or from a flash sound channel if it's on IE11. Um, and I actually have to jump through some hoops to make sure that when we drop frames, or not drop frames, but rather uh, have an audio underrun uh, due to CPU contention, that it recognizes that the time on the clock does not match the number of samples output. Uh, so every time I get a callback from the audio system that says, okay, it's time, uh, it's time for your next chunk of audio, uh, we check and see, okay, what's the clock, and what time do we think the clock should be? Uh, because if the clock has advanced beyond the number of samples we output, that's a problem. Uh, and that gives us a chance to uh, compensate the clock for the actual time of the audio that actually made it out. Uh, and then I base uh, whether to draw and when to decode frames based on that. And it seems to work reasonably well. Uh, also pretty aggressively uh, pause the audio if it gets too out of sync. So, uh, so if you're more than like two frames late, it does a brief delay and then waits till it catches up and then resynchronizes audio. Um, so yes, that took a lot of trial and error to figure out the best way to do that, but it's actually pretty reliable. Unfortunately, we gotta move on for a little bit. We'll fall behind. Boo, Steve. Boo, Steve. Boo. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was Thank awesome. You.